Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, and now an online store. Check out their new commerce solution so you can start selling stuff immediately. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE3. We are not throwing a party. My parents would kill me. Evan, you are such a wuss! Look, I get it. We're losers. But we only have three weeks left, then we go to college. We can be cool then. We can be cool tonight! Oh, come on! One big party can change everything. This party's big enough to change our lives. How's the party, man? Is it crazy? It's, uh... It's average. Oh. Okay. It's as loud as it goes. It, it doesn't. It doesn't go past uh, thirty-two. Go, 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 go. Favorite episode 114. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was hey, Average Party from uh, Woodhead Entertainment. Go look up the whole thing. It's like three minutes long, and it's awesome because they hit all the tropes of party movies, only uh, you know with realistic parties that I've been to. Yeah, no, I, I have definitely been to that party. <laughs> hey, man, and how are you doing, Tom? A reasonably average time. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, but I'm not alone. We got. We no, got, you are not. I smell bodies, and I hear people over the Skypes. Who's joining us today? Joining us today, to your right, if you'll look, Brian, now it can be told, Justin Robert Young is sitting right next to you. Ah, I've apparated here on the twit set. Yeah. And just in time for frame rate. Hello, Accio gentlemen. Welcome. Jury. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we also, uh, Justin Robert Young, you know, with Brian there, how can we not have Justin with him too? But uh, also with us today, because we got some good advertising related stories to talk about. Uh, happy to have Derek Chen back on the show to join us. Uh, been too long, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, glad to jump into our uh, way on advertising. Believe me, when we, I saw these three stories that we're going to have at the top of the show, I realized everything I'm going to say, I'm going to get an email from Derek explaining like, well, you almost got it right. Here's the th things you would you need to be an insider to know. I figured, well, let's just get Derek on and have us tell us those things right off. So appreciate that. No, glad, glad to be here. I was on my the edge of my seat during uh, TNT this morning when you guys were talking about the ad stories. Ah, well, I guess with that, I, I mean, if there's a perfect segue. Let's jump in. What is the big story? This just in, the big story. So three stories that we're talking about today. One, uh, Wired has a story that viewers are flocking to streaming video. Uh, according to a study from the Global Video Index 2012 Year in Review released by Uyala, a California-based company that specializes in online video and video analytics, uh, saying that not only are viewers going there, but advertisers are spending more money, $2.93 billion last year alone. Uh, streaming video content spending climbed 46%. At the same time, there's an article on All Things D from Peter Kafka talking about YouTube's problem, saying... There's streaming plenty. There's plenty of inventory. And you can make arguments about how they could be better at discovery, et cetera. But the problem is they're not able to sell all the inventory they have. And for that reason, it's really hard for the channel operators sometimes to monetize things on YouTube. And then finally, uh, we've got maybe a solution to this problem. I don't know. We'll talk about a little bit about Hitlist, which has a new way of allowing you to watch ads without interrupting your movies. But let's start, uh, Derek, with the, with these first two stories, this idea that we've got plenty of money pouring into online video. Is that is that what you're seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, definitely. 
the video video is the big thing. I mean, every advertiser, every client that you're talking to, at, at least you know from the advertising standpoint, they want video and they're looking for ways to integrate it in. It's just the problem with online video is that it's really fragmented. It's all over the place. You have everything from you know three minute cat clips to you know just the rebroadcast of some TV show uh, that you're watching the next day or live streaming it on ESPN or or CBS Sports or kind of the big events. And it's a little bit all over the place. That's really hard. Um, there's so many different people getting, you know, everyone's jumping in on it. That's the problem. It's such a big fad. So everyone has their own version of how to do video that it becomes really confusing to to figure out, you know, what's the best way to monetize on this? What's the best way to even integrate with video? And uh, that's what we're seeing right now is that you just you're having a lot of confusion. YouTube has one strategy. You have kind of the that network and the cable um, channels doing another strategy. And and I think right now we're kind of in that growing pain where we're still trying to figure out you know, what, how do people consume video and where is the best place to kind of consume that video? Now, a lot of people out there may be wondering, like, well, what do I care? I don't want ads. In fact, Ken from Chicago is like, three-minute ad for a 30-second YouTube clip. That's a problem. Yes, obviously. But that's not even what we're talking about here. We're talking about the ability to sell ads so that you make enough money that you can do high-quality content. Right. Uh, and this is one of the things that we've talked about on the show before is that perversely, more people putting more ads online is good if what you want is high quality content for free in the online space. Now, we've already seen exceptional content from like House of Cards on the uh, on Netflix. But of course, that's a different uh, paradigm. We, on the flip side, we've seen stuff like from YouTube pump a ton of money into these partner networks to create television level or what we think of as television quality uh, content but the problem in this article it says like look you can't you can't do that and then get paid only two thousand five hundred dollars when it when it hits a million views that's not that's not going to be enough to sustain that like that'll work uh, justin and i were talking about this on the drive up where it's like twenty five hundred for a million views is great if you're a guy with a webcam yeah and you could turn on your webcam three times a week and manage to eke out six hundred thousand views or whatever <laughs> but, but, but it's not enough to, to to create what we would consider real programming I think what we're looking at is two different things, though. You know, you have the larger idea that, uh, as uh, you know, was said earlier, people are flocking to, uh, to to spend money on video. We just don't quite know what video is uh, and how to quantify uh, where to put the advertisement. The 800-pound gorilla in all of this is YouTube. You know, because they're the ad-supported model. I mean, YouTube and Hulu right now are the destination places where you would want to put big ticket, big money advertising. And in that All Things D uh, article, it seems like this is a very narrow problem of people who are making good quality stuff being upset with YouTube and Google that they're not selling out this inventory the way they the, the way that they can because they don't have people that are. Very specifically, well, dedicated video sales ad people. sales, well, right. and and, well, and like the same way, they're not they don't have like what a television network right. would would go out to get what, those kind of ads. And even worse, like the idea of ha of hiring a staff of dedicated ad sales professional is very un Google. Google likes to build systems. You come here, hit button, right? I will yeah, take your credit this, card. In right. this article, it says right. when Google launched cost per click, everybody thought, "Oh, that's going to ruin the display advertising model." It didn't. It just changed things. Derek, is that what we're experiencing here? We're just waiting for the kinks to be worked out of a new model. Well, the problem with YouTube actually is that YouTube it's one of those catch twenty two things where you have to go to YouTube at this point just because it is kind of that prime destination. A lot of people, I mean, YouTube is kind of that number one destination for videos of all sorts, whether it's you know long form or short form. But the problem with YouTube in particular is that Google sells it like search, and the like as an advertiser, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to I can't really say I want to buy this particular show. The way I buy YouTube is you know. You buy it by category, you buy it by keywords. It's very search kind of focused. So, you know, because the, the big problem is if you're buying, if you're, if Google just sells it by its premium shows, people are only going to buy the premium shows. And it's going to be this remnant inventory, videos of stuff that it's uploaded, but people don't really want. And so the problem is that YouTube kind of just bundles it together. And I think their, their strength is search. So they just kind of insert, you know, the... They group all these different videos again by by category by keywords, and they just kind of sell it in giant lumps, and that's what we're having right now. And I think that's why people are getting frustrated is that they're it, no no one's really seeing 
the, the the kind of the strength of of each YouTube video is just kind of being sold as just a lump of video. Well, and I guess that's sense. that's the whole question, Derek. Is is this untenable? Is this are we seeing the end of this, and there needs to be something new, or is this a case where they just need a more fidelity? Because at this point, one of the side effects of creating all this content is that there aren't enough ad dollars to support as many programs as we're trying to create on on YouTube. Well, and also well, well, this 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 is not just uh, a problem of them not getting uh you know the the money in. It's also that YouTube puts restrictions on the kind of ads that you can put in your own like let's say, you know, like me and let's say theoretically me and Brian had a web show and we got Google money to make that show. Uh Google dictates to us that we can't then just go to Velveeta cheese and sell out, you know, four ad blocks of Velveeta cheese ads. We can only have one, right? You know, and then they are saying, but like, number one, you're going to get our startup money, and you have to agree that whatever we're feeding you, ad money wise, is good enough for what you are doing. And I think, you know, whether they like it or not, it is going to shape the kind of content that we want to or that we will see on YouTube. It will shape the platform creatively if you don't allow for high-end stuff to live and thrive there, which it would if, like what Derek said, you were able to just buy the, the you know, Kevin Spacey wants to do a series on YouTube. I just want to buy the Kevin Spacey show. I don't want to buy a thing with this demographic. So Derek, well, back the to Brian's question, is that, is that tenable? Can that happen? Well, I mean, that's what we're seeing is that you have companies like Machinima, you know, these large high production companies, which I think, unfortunately, they're the ones who have the resources to kind of send out sales teams to say, hey, you know, invest in, you know, put money into our company or advertisers, you know, instead of just buying, you know, through YouTube, which you might get part of within that inventory, some stuff from Machinima, buy through us directly or, you know, invest in this much money and we can do kind of a bigger integrated deal where we can, you know, maybe get your content within a show or have just kind of call outs within the show. I mean, that's what you're seeing is that a lot of these larger video production studios, they're coming up with ways to integrate the ads kind of within the video itself so that they don't have to have YouTube doing the ads for them. And I think that's one way that they're getting around. Unfortunately, that kind of weeds people out where you need to be large enough to have that, you know, ad sales team or or the ability to kind of reach out to advertisers well, and, otherwise. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, you make a very good point because essentially what you do is you skew the type of content that you're going to have because uh, if if there are rules, like you cannot stop talking and then talk about Velveeta three times in one hour, yeah. but you can quietly work out a deal with Velveeta Cheese. We're like, we're going to do a whole episode. It's going to be about grilled cheese sandwiches. Give us a million dollars and it'll be Velveeta in there. And so likewise, you look at like Machinima Prime, uh, essentially what, what they're doing now, if you look at their content, uh, they're in a perfect position because they're kind of like the way cartoons in the 80s were. When they deregulated cartoons and you were allowed to make cartoons that essentially were giant advertisements for toys. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, they, they, they don't directly get paid by Microsoft to, to run Halo, but instead Halo or Microsoft invests millions of dollars to create high quality Halo programming that essentially is a, a way to legitimize the game. It's a way for them to give fan service and be like, look, it's a Halo movie. And then Machinima Prime gets to run it and collect all of the ad revenues. So uh, it doesn't necessarily fix anything to say, uh, okay, you can't stop and we want to dictate these terms. It just as many general rules like this does, it just drives the commerce underground. Well, I, but I also think you guys are missing the bigger point here, which is not just that YouTube says, look, we're going to sell things so you guys don't put ads in here because we're going to take care of it. They're not fulfilling on that promise. It'd be fine yes. if you couldn't put your own ads in if YouTube was fulfilling on the promise, but they're not. And granted, I should disclose my wife works for YouTube, but I don't have any inside knowledge on this. What I do know is that, according to Peter Kafka's article, YouTube sells ads the way with with the same ad sales team that google sells everything with so there's no specialty way to buy a particular thing and derek i want to ask you with nielsen coming down the road here i'm going to be rating things granted that's probably more beneficial for somebody like hulu uh, who can now say hey the eyeballs on hulu are counted by nielsen is that help youtube any would that will that kind of force them into saying hey we need to sell some shows individually I, I think it really depends on that partnership with Nielsen. The problem with YouTube, again, is that they have way too many videos. You have everything from 30-second clips to, to you know, a series like H+. But it, it's really dependent on whether or not they can get lock in or uh, create a deal with Nielsen where they get these kind of longer-form shows measured by Nielsen. Because if they can't get that measured, 
I, I really doubt they're going to measure all the other smaller videos out there. And that's the problem is YouTube's just too big in scale. There's just too much going on out there that it's really ha hard to kind of quantify anything. It's hard to really even pitch it because, you know, what are you as YouTube? What are you pitching? You're pitching pretty much every video there is on the Internet. And for an advertiser, that th that's still kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around because it's like, well, do I want my ad around a 30 second clip of a cat or do I want it, my ad in front of, you know, this <laughs> this show that apparently only Internet people know about? And, and so... You know, I think YouTube kind of has to almost rethink their strategy in terms of, you know, how how is video supposed to be sold? I don't know if the search vehicle, the way that, you know, doing it the way they do search is really the right way to move forward with uh, video. At I'll, least. I'll tell you what, Tom, if you don't mind, I'm going to pinch one of the three letters that we had in the feedback segment because sure. Derek kind of just gave us the answer uh, from, straight from the source. Uh, the letter read, and forgive me, I don't have the name of it, but it said, Dear Tom and Brian, I was very interested to hear about Nielsen's announcement to finally add streaming video TV shows on the Internet with their ratings, which you discussed last week's episode. I believe you mentioned that they'll add the Internet streaming views of their current 20,000-plus participating TV households to their ratings. However, why can't they simply get the real numbers instead of stream, uh, of stream shows from all Hulu, Netflix, iTunes, Amazon, etc. viewers and uh, show them as the actual ratings for all internet viewed shows wouldn't that be more accurate than the sample small percentage of the current tv ratings consist of um and so uh, i think i think derek nailed it where it's like if, if you just do raw numbers stuff gets too skewed and then on paper it looks like nobody wants long format actual good content yeah derek i mean that's why nielsen actually has nielsen net ratings which goes looks looks at page views, not not video streaming. Looks at page views, and they they have a panel that they survey rather than just going and getting raw numbers because that way they're in control of the sample size, right? And they can say we're pretty statistically sure that this is within a margin of accuracy. Whereas if, if you're getting different measurements from different places, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges. Yeah, there's definitely still that difficulty. I mean, even. With Nielsen, um, at least in my personal experience and, you know, just my personal experience in the ad agency, um, Nielsen is still more kind of a TV um, tool. And so, you know, when you we hear Nielsen quote, quote a lot, it usually is focused more within kind of the TV buying teams and playing teams in comparison to kind of traditional television. The weird thing is even kind of especially in, uh, in digital, um, I focus on comm score numbers. Um, and so... And Comscore has its own way of uh, viewing, uh, rating kind of um, video as well. And so that becomes this weird thing where even kind of apples to oranges when we're trying to put together. I mean, that's always a difficulty is when I'm trying to put my numbers to TV numbers and we're trying to find a way to make our uh, GRPs kind of match and everything. But uh, th there's just kind of this weird, the, I guess, disconnection where you're not really having everyone play by one set of numbers, one set of ratings. And so it, it's still all over the place is pretty much kind of the difficulty. Right. And if Nielsen took raw numbers, but then also had their, their regular TV ratings, it would be harder to marry those numbers among, among many other issues. But real quickly, before we get off the big story, I want to mention HitBliss, which is a whole different way of selling advertising. Uh, with HitBliss, you actually watch ads voluntarily and you get dollars in your account to spend on the hit list store now they haven't partnered with everybody but they partnered with some major studios out there uh it, let's see uh, hit bliss has deals with warner brothers paramount and universal uh and stars and a few other tv production houses so they're they're gonna keep building they're gonna keep striking these deals and they're gonna sell these videos just like other like voodoo or itunes out there but their deal is we're not going to show you ads before them like hulu we're going to show you ads whenever you want to see an ad and we're going to try to deliver you ads based on your preferences you opt into telling us what you want to tell us and we'll tailor the ads to you and you'll get a little more credit the more uh information you share with us and that credit is is listed in real dollar amounts that you can just go and spend on our store or you can go and spend on our store with your own money and your credit card yeah yeah and that's the important part there at the end is the fact that they preserve the value of the content by saying at any time if you don't want any ads at all you could go ahead and buy it yourself and in the article it mentions that part of this was born of the frustration of what happened when hulu started uh, making it possible to watch the entire criterion collection the problem is is you would see 
we'll just continue with the Velveeta cheese example. You're in the middle of this immersive movie. Let's and give all of a Rotel. Sudden, let's give Rotel some some time. There you go. And it's Rotel ads the entire you know every every 15 minutes the entire way through. And of course, in a movie, it's a lot more jarring to be taken out of a moment, especially when it's a clip at random throughout the entire thing. Uh, I actually think this is great because it recognizes that that nothing is free. It, it, that's the baseline assumption: is that let's stop thinking that anything is free. Even when you watch free content on Hulu, you are paying with your time and by listening listening to this message. And so by monetizing that, by, by physically putting a number to it and saying, you have given us $4.87 of time value, you may spend that on any of these movies that are $1.99 each. I think it's great. But Justin, you sound a little more skeptical of this when we talked about it. Well, I, you know, I, I, it's not that I don't think it's an interesting idea. Uh, it just, to me, seems like, uh, and it does solve a problem. And I like some of the underlying things, like you mentioned, that we, we need to get out of this idea that anything is, you know, owed to us or that it should be free on the Internet. Uh, especially if we want more and better quality stuff that is uh, available through the Internet. It just seems to me like this is a solution from an ad seller, an ad buyer perspective that does not necessarily have a customer-friendly ring to it. And, and I think that, yeah, it's a cool workaround, but I don't know if it's going to get a big mass adoption because I don't really feel like it's tremendously customer-friendly. Like, like the, the method that we have now of breaking everything up, as annoying as it is, to, especially when you're trying to catch up. I was trying to watch Community on Hulu, and you see the same, you know, Ford ad like a million and a half times. Yeah. It is that way for a reason because custom, the customers have decided this is how we want to make that bargain. Derek is That's nodding not vigorously. True. Hold on. Derek, <laughs> De I want to I hear from Derek because he's nodding vigorously this whole time. Well, you know, I'm, I'm obviously – the thing is – what they're offering isn't really a new idea. We see it maybe we haven't really seen it maybe for kind of long form video, but we've seen a lot of these. I still call it incentivized kind of engagement. Um, you know, there's been a lot of other companies where it's like, hey, if you click on this ad or if you watch this 15 second clip, you'll get five free coins on this kind of social, you know, social game on Facebook. Or, if you know, you'll get points to this retailer. Uh, there's tons of companies out there that have already been doing similar things, maybe, again, in different formats. Answer this poll unit, you'll get X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, it, it's been out there. And for me, I'm always a little bit skeptical because it's still incentivized, right? Because you're still, you're getting people to do something so that they could get something else. So for me, it, I want to make sure as an advertiser that people are our gender, I'm reaching the right people and the people who are engaging or watching this video are doing so because they are the right people that I'm trying to reach and not just because this person wants to get five free minutes of, of you know, House of Cards or whatever. And so they're just clicking through and watching as many ads as they can or, you know, just filling out whatever but information. But the key to get here, something. I was going to say the key here is that you choose the ads. It's like a Pandora for ads, right? And it's yeah, based but then you on get your it finally. <laughs> you get it, it depends on what you how many choices you have, right? You get three choices and one's you know of you know of a female of a hygiene product. Another one's a household cleaner, and one is a movie. You know, I, I think a lot of people tend to skew in one direction over another. Um, you know, I, I'm. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I think it just we would I would really have to see kind of how it's executed the, and, and kind the other of thing the context you, of how it's done. You don't have to watch the ad. Most of the things that have tried this have said, hey, you just watch ads and build up credit and then you can get free stuff. And that's the end of it. Right. These guys are saying, look, you watch an ad, we'll give you a dollar credit or don't watch any ads. We don't care. Just pay you a dollar, you know, pay five dollars. Then they're just another show. store. Of which there's a billion different ways to get this content, be it iTunes or Amazon. But they're not just or, another store because they also have the way to get free credit, which you don't have at Amazon. Yeah, yes, but I mean, like, just because they are two of those ideas sewn together does not make them a new idea. You know, there's the incentivized viewing, and then there's the buy stuff from the store. Like, they are still just those two so old you don't ideas. like having options. I understand that about you. <laughs> no, we have infinite <laughs> options. We have the internet. I'm yes. saying if somebody really, really, really wants to not watch ads and get what they want, we all know how they're going to get I mean, it. You're, you're creating the, the edge. What about the people who are like, yeah, I might want to watch a few ads, but I don't want to have to watch it all the time. So I'm not going to get that service that makes me watch ads to build up credit. But this one, I can watch a few ads, and when I get tired of ads, then I can just pay. That's it's, And you're paying less. You're not watching ads. The ads are tailored to you. Theoretically, it, 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 it's prorated. Like I can get 
like X amount through a episode yeah. and then it's cheaper? Well, no, it's just it's basically you just get a dollar amount in your account based on how many ads you watch. Oh, and if yeah. it costs five dollars and you got two dollars in your account, you just pay the three dollars. Boom. I mean, I guess listen, I, I might be wrong and we might be living in the hitless centric universe, but like I just don't see people using it. Well, you know what, Justin? For all my disagreements with your semantics, I actually agree with you. Hey! <laughs> I don't think people are going to use it either. Because you know why? It's, it's because of all the conversation we just had to understand it. It's not that it's a bad idea. It's not that if people got used to it, it wouldn't work. It's not that advertisers wouldn't get on board if there were enough choice on there and the ads were suited. It's that they'll never get the momentum because it takes too long to explain. I, I totally hear you. I'm more optimistic than any of you guys. Because, look, if, they're if these people who are trying to seduce, like, there exists a certain number of people who are going to piracy because, uh, you know, because they don't want to pay, but they probably feel bad about it. But the problem is, is there's no way, there's no other alternative, right? But if there's a way to do it, and if they're savvy enough to find this stuff on, on the pirate networks, then they're savvy enough to understand, hey, man, I can spend three minutes looking at some videos, and now I'm watching it free and clear, and I have a clean conscience. I think, I think that, that there's a, market, a, a, a chunk of the market that that would be uh, sedu seductive for. I don't know. I mean, to, to me, I think you know, we are far more you know, going toward a, a universe where you know, a product placement is, is going to be what the way that we are forced to watch ads, you know, uh, and, and we're going to continue to see that in television and movies. And Obviously, stuff like none of you have seen Star Trek The Next Generation. We're going towards a universe where there is no money. Oh, anymore. please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hear Toronto's like that. And that's another big story. Toronto? Mm -hmm. Toronto. It's in Canada. Stop everything. It's another big story. Actually, it's not really what the another big story is about, but <laughs> uh, what it is about is U.S. film director David Petrarca running afoul of the piracy mafia in, in his in his home country. He was in Australia for a writer's conference. Arr, we're going to make you an R for you can't refuse. <laughs> an R and he said, it's the pirate mafia. <laughs> he was asked if it bothered him because he, he has directed episodes of Game of Thrones and he's, 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 he's a great director. He's directed a lot of great things. Uh, he, he, he was asked, are you bothered that Game of Thrones was the most pirated show of 2012 and that 10% of the downloads came from right here in Australia? And he shrugged and he was like, no, illegal downloads don't matter because shows thrive on cultural buzz and capitalize on that social commentary that's how they survive uh you know so he's like we you know we he's not too worried about it so of course everyone reported that david petrarca thinks piracy is okay yeah which sure. is not, not what he said at all so he rushed to clarify uh that in fact he is 100 percent against piracy in fact he wrote this over and over on his twitter feed uh last week i am 100 percent completely and utterly against people illegally downloading anything i felt like it was a great example of someone being perfectly reasonable and like yeah, yeah the piracy you know that sucks but i don't get too worried about it because really it doesn't hurt us that much in the end he shouldn't have had to run and clarify but i also think that downloading illegally is bad but he did it's the culture of fear that hollywood lives in well, listen, you, there's a reason why that dude's... Look at that dude's IMDb page and his recent work, and he is getting work in HBO. Like, so HBO obviously has a lot invested in people paying for the privilege of watching their content. Uh, that's why they hold so hard to the cable deals. That's why it's so hard to get HBO Go. It's why they don't sell HBO Go separate from the, the cable deals that they have. Uh, so he that is him playing politics at his work and saying, like, hey, I'm not the uh, I'm not off the reservation here because he keeps wanting to work at HBO. Yeah, sure. Well, but and keep in the mind thing also, is, he's right. Yes, with he's 100 percent right. But because with HBO. No, no, no. Well, OK, what it depends on how he says it, because you're right specifically that HBO has had a long history of very clearly saying we don't care about uh, ratings. What we care about is the quality of buzz. programming. We want buzz. We want to be Emmy nominated. We want your friends to, to talk about it. Exactly. And in that regard, certainly HBO is, is different than a lot of other networks. And this is consistent with that. However, he's also right universally because we live in an age where, where there's not just a movie anymore. There's not just a television show. What you do is you build a brand that people identify with and then you monetize in as many different, uh, endlessly diverging, uh, each minuscule way possible. You know, everything 
everything from lunchbox, Game of Thrones lunchboxes, which I don't think exist, but totally should, because I would I'm definitely sure. buy one. Game and of it, Thrones, the flamethrower! <laughs> exactly, right? It's the merchandising, <laughs> dummy, right? So it's like, uh, he is right, where it's like, uh, if what you can do is become a universally known, like, what do you think? Like, you think uh, 15% of America is, is hip to what Game of Thrones is and is into it? It would buy Game of Thrones branded whatever? Or I mean, at least is in the market for it? I, I think that for, I mean, that, that doesn't sound crazy. Like, that they've heard if you took a survey of people, everybody in America, and said, do you know what Game of Thrones is? And right. Well, let's, get, let's not get distracted at the semantics of how many people will buy a freaking winter, of, uh, winter is coming thermos. Oh, a lot dude, of people would be, nice. seriously. Can we, we Hold agree? on. Hold Wait a on. minute. Can, can we, we agree that somebody <laughs> should make a winter is coming thermos? Yeah. Winter, or better yet, winter's already inside this thermos. It's still very cold, <laughs> yeah. and it will stay cold all day. Uh, but the important thing no, is, is no, that no, Tom, were you, were you going to say something? No, I was just saying, let's not get too distracted okay. in whether it's fifty percent or not. The point, yeah. Points taken. Brian is right. A lot of people will buy a lot of stuff. I, right. Absolutely. Let, let me just let me just fill out my point on on HBO. HBO is unique because their goal is to make as much noise as possible, so everybody who is not paying for HBO thinks about paying for HBO and does make the leap to being a subscriber. And people that used to be somebody who subscribed to HBO and now no longer reconsiders their decision. That's why they get rid of shows that have the same viewership but aren't as buzzy. You know, back before Louis C.K. was a darling. He had a reviled show on HBO that nobody liked and everybody thought was lowbrow and stupid. And yeah, but, you're trying, got, but your point you're trying to make, Justin, is that therefore they don't care about piracy. And that's not true at all. No, they no, care no, about no, piracy no, 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 just no. as much as every other network. They, so I don't think do. it changes they the do. debate here. I, I think his point is valid more in an HBO universe than in... A, yeah, but, a crazy ratings driven but the point like, i'm making television. is that even in an hbo universe he had to rush and stumble all over himself and if you look at his twitter feed he was posting constantly i don't believe in piracy is okay i don't believe that piracy is okay i i think he feared for his life and it wouldn't have mattered whether he was working at hbo cbs or anything else the point is that you can't say something reasonable like he said without people on both sides just tearing it in and, and exaggerating it and, and turning it into this ridiculous thing that it wasn't what but, Petrarca said. But this said. is, I mean, like, people are losing their jobs. Like, like that we are, we are seeing, we are, we, are, we are seeing a shifting dynamic when it comes to uh, television and entertainment. Uh, there's, you know, there are a, a lot of things at play here. So it's a sensitive issue. I can understand not that to say that he was wrong or she should have to, uh, hide this or go back on it, but I can understand why it's a really highly charged, uh, well, yeah, situation. And, 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 and what, what, what Tom is saying is that it shouldn't be, that it's a crime that he had to spend that much time defending himself. I mean, and but like, sort of, um, we're not in the middle of it, though. So it's hard to have a rational debate about what we should do about online content in that kind of climate. Absolutely. I agree. Although the Internet's never been exactly the home of rational debate. Yeah, exactly. It Finally. Been, we can get back to rationally <laughs> debating things. No, no, it has been. It hasn't been exclusively the home That's true. Of it's too shit, debate. man. Even the majority home. Uh, I'll tell you what. There's no debate about, Tom. Is that, that if you want a high quality blog portfolio or any other kind of website, hell, if you want to start a commercial business, you know where you should go? I well, you know what? Actually, I, I would say Squarespace, Brian, but um the problem is Sword and Laser got a bunch of t-shirts now. We're we're selling t-shirts, so we need an online store. No, see, did, did, oh, you missed I said it. Even an online store, Squarespace has you covered. They got commerce solutions. In fact, I'll bet I emailed you earlier, document. Open up your email. Look it up. I wrote you down some talking points that I think you'll find very appealing for your business. Wait, wait, look at the no fast merchant account setup so I can I can accept payments right away. Yep. Credit or debit card. See? Single interface for order management, tracking Told orders, you. providing customer email. Square a new business plan yep. includes the commerce solution just at twenty four dollars a month when you sign up for a year or thirty dollars a month. For the monthly plan. Now, do I still get the mobile responsive designs so that my template looks beautiful no matter what size screen anybody's Tom, looking at? Tommy, Tommy boy. Come on, man. Who do you think you're dealing with? Some fly-by-night chump operation? We're talking about a group that's so dedicated to their customer in the middle of a hurricane, they go traipsing up with dangerous pails full of diesel just to keep the generators running on their servers. Of course you get all that stuff. That's what makes our friends over at Squarespace so freaking rad. So wait a minute. What you're saying, if I'm if I'm hearing you right, Brian, and if these points that you sent me are correct, Squarespace is an all-in-one platform integrating 
all your website needs, domains, design, development, commerce, hosting, and 24-7 customer support? Yes, I am saying all those things. And making me coffee every morning in my own bedroom? No, now let's not get silly. For that, okay. you need the coffee fairy. Totally different right. opportunity. We'll wait for that feature to be rolled up. But in the meantime, that's actually pretty darn good. Uh, so, folks, go sign up for a free account. Uh, no credit card needed. You just try it out. Start building your website. All you need is an email address because, you know what, they, they got to send you the, the link, right? Try it out. If you decide to purchase it, use the offer code frame rate three and that gets you 10 percent off your first purchase on new accounts whether you buy a monthly account 10 percent off that first month or an annual plan 10 percent off the entire freaking year and don't forget about free domain registrations for annual plan customer subscriptions that's squarespace.com use that offer code frame rate three everything you need to create an exceptional website and you know we literally thank squarespace every day in my household uh, and we thank them for their support of frame rate we do. Like, just before we sit down to dinner, we're like, can we take a moment and just yeah. contemplate how Squarespace made this meal possible? The founder of the feast. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I use it for certain laser. I use it for merit books. It's, uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, let's, let's have a little awesome slipstream. So Hulu's doing fine. We've had a lot of stories about how great they're doing. They're not doing quite as well as Netflix on the numbers side, but they're doing okay. Until soon, because Hulu CEO Jason Killar is stepping down from the company next month, and we're already getting Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal reporting that Disney and News Corp have started talking about selling their stake in the company to the other one. Now, don't forget Comcast Universal, which owns NBC, is the other owner in this equation of the network owners. But because they bought NBC, Comcast can't take any part in decisions. They can only hold the stock. So for now, it's up to Disney and News Corp to have these conversations. They're already slicing up the feast here. Well, and they also keep in mind that, that each of them have said that, or, or rumors are, that each is willing to sell to the other. But it sounds like they're both also amenable to selling to a third party. And it seems like a lot of their dispute is that uh, Disney wants to see, uh, and this is all rumored, uh, Disney wants to see them go more free and ad supported, whereas uh, News Corp, uh, unsurprisingly, would rather see a, a closed paid service, something closer to a Netflix type things. Uh, Hulu Plus type thing. Yeah, more Hulu. Yeah. Well, but Hulu Plus, is, of course, is the worst of all worlds because you pay and then also still get the ads. That's what News Corp wants. Right? Yeah. They want the worst yeah, of all worlds. The, yes. The darkest of all the timelines. <laughs> uh, you know, there's. There is an interesting idea, though. Like we talked about in the first story, that there's more and more and more people watching only tablets, and that, that the question I think in, in one of the articles, uh, the, the the awesome the money quote was: "This is not going to be decided by cord cutters. It's going to be decided by the people who never had a cord that that have just completely grown up in a world where you're not buying cable ever, and that's where you're really going What's to see the cord, atrophy. mommy. Exactly." Uh, <laughs> In that world, is a Hulu Plus a, a first a place where you pay money and the next day every show that you want to watch is up there for you to watch? That's a very valuable service. I mean, that basically is the new cable if you can do it correctly. And and you know, like so it's not crazy to think that, you know, from the News Corp perspective, that that's a really interesting uh, you know, way to strategy to go about it. Cause I know I'll tell you what, uh, I have been uh in a household that has Hulu Plus uh from uh, a friend of mine and uh, it's a great service. I, I now having tried it out, I, I'm way more amenable to uh to actually subscribing to it. There is what just that, is it, that ad what problem. What is it about Hulu Plus that you found uh, beneficial? I, uh, it, the idea that I can just that something can come on television the night before, and then I, it can just be my DVR in the cloud, and I can go catch up on stuff. Right. Well, uh, but or, I do or, that or already just, without paying for Hulu Plus. Right, but you have to remember in advance to bother to set your DVR. No, and no, it, no. I get it off Hulu on my MacBook, and then I AirPlay it to Apple TV without paying for Hulu Plus. Well, well, but there are things there. There are content restrictions, though, right? Like there are not, things that are on not, Hulu Plus. Not any that have ever mattered. I have my Hulu Plus subscription on pause, and I'm like, if I ever run into something I want to watch that I have to pay for Hulu Plus to get, I will unpause it, and I have never unpaused it. 
Yeah, well, and Bonnie the, was uh, Bonnie was the same way about the convenience of yeah. She liked Hulu Plus because she could watch it on her iPad. She didn't want to have to lug around her laptop everywhere, uh, and she liked it up until she started to realize that even though she was paying for Hulu Plus, there were still giant chunks of the content library that weren't available, and she was tired of getting like some episodes into something and then couldn't get any more. And so she she paused it a while ago. I, I think that um, I think that. Where we are now, I, well, Hulu Plus is what, two years old now or so? Like, I think we, we have come to expect a certain amount of fidelity that Hulu Plus is not offering at this point. I, I think it's it, a real problem. And, but is this a question where it, it, is, it is the proverbial ass with two masters? It, it is it trying to be the, that's a proverb, look it up. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is trying to serve the ad free or the, the, the free ad supported model and also trying to be a paid. Uh, premium service and can you be both or will you always compromise you should split the ass don't you think derek (laughs) yeah come on derek why won't you answer the question you're gonna split that ass come on (laughs) split the ass yes or no you know i'm I'm looking at the other cheek of things right now and you know i I think the big thing about hulu plus is also that it's the portability of it you know it's the fact that you watch Hulu Plus on your tablet, you watch on your Xbox, you watch on your Roku, and and that that's what I think. You know, a lot of people. You know, there are a few people who connect obviously their their computers, their traditional desktop or laptops to it to watch Hulu Plus on their television. And obviously, if you have a Apple computer, it makes it a little bit easier. But I think at the same time, you know, people like the convenience, and it, you know, if it's just paying this amount that I can just already have my Xbox that's, that's already connected, and all I have to do is kind of switch over to it. I, I think it it. it, it Right. I think people just like to like that kind of convenience. I think that's why a lot of people also like to just stick with Hulu Plus, even though, it, you know, it, it, you're paying for the convenience. You're paying for the fact that you can watch it, you know, on your mobile device at work. You can watch it um, at home, you know, connected to your TV. It's it's that part of that convenience. I think that's just as much of a factor as it is the back catalog or and all these other things that you guys have talked about. Yeah, but if All right, you- we got a, a bunch of other stuff we want to blaze through because we have uh, we have some breaking news about the summer movie draft to get to. Uh, hey, hey, Sony- real, 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 real quick, can I just ask this? How no. long has it taken Jason Kalar to leave Hulu? I feel like this has been like <laughs> a year and a half. Cal Ripken retired faster than there were Jason rumors Kalar. that he was going to leave, and then it, there was when he actually announced he was going to leave. And from the actual time that Jason said he was going to Whatever. leave, until the day he was going to leave, has been exactly what he said it was going to be. So prepare to fast uh, forward. You're gonna wear. You're going to uh, wait longer to get a 4K movie downloaded because apparently. Uh, according to Phil Molyneux, they are going to do 4K movies. They haven't figured out exactly how. He wouldn't quite say PS4. He wouldn't say those words, but he all but alluded to the fact that, like, oh, yeah, you know, I promise you won't be disappointed. Wink, wink, wink. Uh, but also, these these 4K movies right now are 100 gigabytes to download a movie. I think... So, well, I mean, we've, we've said this before. I think that 4K displays have, have an awesome future because once you see one, it's going to be exquisite for what it is. But I think movies is the worst possible way to encourage 4K. We don't even want to watch our movies in the movie theater in 4K. We go and we got to watch them in 2K where they're all displayed that way. I, I just don't understand this obsession with content being shown at that, at that level. I mean, it's new. Is it? Isn't the difficulty also with kind of, I mean, you know, there was that story about kind of Time Warner saying people don't really need super high speed internet. I mean, isn't that also an issue too? Is, you know, thinking about the PS4, whether it's watching kind of really high definition videos or downloading games. I mean, the, the problem is also you don't want to wait five hours to finally download the piece of content you want. I think. Well, well no, that's we, just that's it. That's why you need, why you need to be in Kansas too. City where you can download it in a second. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the whole thing is is essentially you've taken an acceptable mode of watching a movie and you've promised a almost undetectable from a certain distance it is completely undetectable increase in fidelity for a massive increase in trouble and that's not going to work now on the flip side 4k display saying hey brian how dumb is it that you have four monitors with your multiple monitor mouse going all over the place wouldn't you love to replace that with a 4k video wall with extraordinary fidelity that that takes up everything on your desktop space that i would pay a crap ton of money for i'd I'd drop ten thousand dollars if i had it on that 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you would, uh, if you would, just take that last uh, discussion segment here uh, and uh, clip out 4K, put in HD. You got yourself a repeat of an episode of Buzz Out Loud from 2007. There it is. Let's talk about Cablevision <laughs> suing Viacom for forcing it to pay for channels no one wants. The suit calls out Palladia, MTV Hits, and VH1 Classic as a few of undesirable networks. It claims Viacom has abused its market power in order to coerce Cablevision to carry them. If Cablevision who have plowed the way for remote DVRs, by the way. It's one of the reasons Aereo is still in business. If they are able to win this case, or at least push it far enough, they could break bundling. Yeah, I'll tell you what. This is, and I know we got to speed things up here because we're running long, but, uh, but this is great when the sharks start to eat themselves. It's, it says that, uh, that uh, I would like to think this means that revolution is near. Well, but, I mean, ultimately, the reason why we have bundling is not is, is because they are... Uh, that powerful. I mean, the entire industry, the cable industry, is built on the concept of bundling from an economic point of view. So this is a battle of egos, and I'm curious to see who wins. I would like to see if there's a legal precedent for for more a la carte uh, offerings, because I think that we are headed toward that for cable as they, uh, you know, see this oncoming storm of of the internet. But uh, I don't know if this is the beginning of the end. Well, well, that's the sad thing, right? Is that you have all these, all these channels, all these things that they're putting together, and they can't put it online. They still choose to put it on TV. I mean, well, how great would it be if so all these, you know, channels that maybe you don't get a large pool of people on television, but if you move it to YouTube or whatever online destination, you'll get that mass audience. I mean, that's the sad thing that I don't think people really see yet. CBS is thinking about creating original content for streaming services like Netflix, like Amazon. Those were mentioned uh, by distribution group CEO Armando Nunez saying, hey, it's definitely a possibility. If you can get the right model to work, I can see us doing that. So CBS starting to eyeball this sort of like, hey, that house of cards, that, that seems to be doing all right. We can make a little money off that. And don't forget, CBS, not just a network that you recognize from broadcast television, but also a, a production studio. company. They produce things like American Idol, which right. airs on Fox. Right. Now, uh, but, and now the, the, the sexiest part of House of Cards to CBS was the $100 million it got for a guaranteed two seasons. That's what they, they want. Oh, uh, so you think CBS could swagger in and be like, hey, man, you're throwing $100 million at some yahoos. We CBS. How about, we did how much Network. do we merit? And that's, yeah. I mean, it, 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 that's not crazy. I mean, yeah. they can Put say, hey, look. Dailies in a little blue box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is what, uh, you know, they, they look at this and just say, hey, look, here's another network to buy stuff for us. I mean, how many pilots do they commission, you know, or, or right. are commissioned that just never go anywhere? Now you that's have another network to sell it to. Yep. We, we just got some stuff to uh, to collect here uh, to let folks know. Uh, Amazon Instant Video scored a deal with Scripps Network. If you don't know Scripps, you probably do know Scripps. They do HGTV, DIY, Food Network, Travel Channel. Uh, and, and so this isn't an exclusive deal, but it's all of those reality shows that you love uh, coming to Amazon Instant. Also, Canadians should know that the movie network Go has launched on iOS and the web. So you can get an HBO Go style experience in Canada with the movie network on cable there. And Netflix in the UK uh, grabbed exclusive streaming rights for The Hunger Games, actually UK and Ireland, starting March 3rd. So uh, congratulations, UK. May the odds be ever in your favor. Let's see what's on Tube Tops. <laughs> Actually, just one story in here, and it's kind of a YouTube story, really. But YouTube uh, adding to its iOS app the AirPlay-like video streaming. There's already AirPlay. Uh, for smart TVs, this is the one where you don't even have to install anything on the TV. If the TV is enabled with this protocol, you can just press a button from any Android phone, and it will stream right to the TV. That's been added to the iOS app now, uh, as well as support for Xbox 360 and PS3. Yeah. You don't, yeah. want to, you, you don't want to mention this crazy TV somebody forwarded me the other day. <laughs> Can we at least see just a second sure, of it? Sure, what? What are you talking about? The, oh, dude, take, take, uh, click on this link and play this video. Oh, kind of I, jump you ahead. put this in after I already opened my links. Yeah, I sorry. I, okay, so somebody forwards this to me. C-Seed, C-S-E-E-D.com. Uh, if you look at it, you got some rich, smug jerk grabbing his fancy <laughs> ass wine and he's no, going you know, out you have to understand for the audio listeners this is like a parody of a rich guy he's now walking out to his model wife on their Shea lounge in this gorgeous palatial estate as he creepily makes a European move to like kiss her and then what opens up 
a giant. Uh, yeah, and like at this point, like I thought it was a parody. I thought that this was going to be a joke of some sort, but it's not. It's a beautiful reality. Uh, yeah, basically, this thing comes shooting up 13 feet out of the ground, unfolds like solar panels off of the International Space Station, and starts showing uh, his smug, I assume, like, what, 720p content with bright day daylight LED or else LEDs. Yeah, so it, it's basically like I hear this. thunder, honey. <laughs> it's like, imagine if you go to see, like, a live sporting event, and, like, not the big Jumbotron, but, like, the smaller one they have in yeah. the opposite end. Like, that, imagine that in your lawn. I don't know. And I'm sure it's making the rounds. I'm sure people, some of you have seen this before, but I, I loved the fact that I live in a world where this kind of thing exists. And it would be a crime if we didn't even acknowledge it here on Frame Rate. A crime has been averted. Let's go on to film. <laughs> <laughs> so David Cross, the actor from Arrested Development, uh, actually saying that Arrested Development is going to be historical. He had an interview with The Hollywood Reporter on Thursday and said that producing the show for Netflix uh, was different than anything else he's ever done. He said what Mitch, talking about Mitch Hurwitz, uh, what Mitch did and how he's able to tell the story through the Netflix model, I think it's going to redefine what television can be and stories can be and how they're presented. And when we were talking to Dana Brunetti on the show a couple of weeks ago, he sort of was saying the similar things. Like, we got to tell the story in the way we wanted because we didn't have the suits upstairs going, eh, we got the overnights and uh, people don't really like this, that, or the other thing. They were just able to say, you know what, people are going to binge watch this, so we can play things things out slowly and they'll still work. Yeah. Well, and I suppose none of us uh, should have exp or should have thought otherwise. I mean, of course, we're all watching this happen. Of course, it's revolutionary. Of course, it is historical. Um, but I suppose the only thing you can really read into this from a content perspective is uh, if, when you have the actors out there uh, evangelizing for what this this means, it's usually a, good, a better sign as to the quality as, as a proxy. Well, and David Cross has had a longstanding uh uh, anger toward the networks. There's a great uh, extra on, I believe, the second or third uh, Arrested Development season that I'm sure you can find online uh, where it's just him ripping into Fox. Like, like it's like, like in, while he's like, on set, like in, in makeup, right? In makeup, I believe he's like halfway through Mrs. Featherbottom. Yes, and like he get he launches into this this real screed. like screed about how uh, you know nothing is wrong with the rest of the development. What's wrong is how Fox marketed it and uh, just all the mistakes that Fox made along the way. So it's really no shock or surprise that David Cross would be excited to see the traditional system uh, fall fire to too, its yeah. knees. Uh, but I mean, it is. It's it's amazing. I mean, like we'll we'll see how it does. I, I love the fact that Arrested Development is already so popular that uh, Reed Hastings from Netflix had to come out and be like, "Listen, don't ask us for season two of Arrested <laughs> Development. Like, it's not going to happen. So that way, if it does happen, it'll be like, hey, well, I no, did it. Like they, they did. They never planned for that to happen. Correct. They, Correct. They, the True. idea was to do a season on Netflix and then have that set up movies. So a lot of people are misinterpreting. Uh, what's going on there. It was That was the plan from the beginning, and that's actually part of the brilliance of it, is they can get Netflix to go, yeah, we'll just take one season. Whereas a network would be like, no, we want options on 15 seasons, yeah. although we'll give you one, and then we'll cut everybody's contracts. Right. Uh, but but uh, I'll tell you what, if Mitch... The great comedy about a struggling comic book publisher recruited by the police is coming to the Xbox 360. This is a UK creator, Adam Handy, saying that this is the only way he could get his movie out. It's a British independent film uh, and and now, it, the way this article in the BBC reads, this is the only way you can get an indie film out in the UK. Anybody buy that? No, not for a second, and I'm kind of offended that he would even say that. And it's like, look, I understand. If you want to play up the novelty of your distribution method, then play up the novelty of it. But uh, but does it ring, it just rings hollow to say the only way, poor me, the only way I could get this, my real story out, is on Samsung brand mobile devices. That's how terrible my plight is. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, it could be that everybody else said no. Yeah, I mean, there's something to say, like, this is kind of replaced direct to DVD. So I, I will take his point there to be like, there used to be a way if you couldn't really get a theater release, there was another avenue to go. And that avenue has sort of collapsed. I mean, it, it, as far as I know. All right. So what's this social studios turning your Facebook feed into a TV show? Yeah, uh, Derek, uh, d do you want a show that is created entirely for you, hosted by Noah Tishby, uh, that gives you 
the update on the like top five most liked posts on Facebook? Oh, I don't personally, I don't think I'd want that, but you did hit the big advertising buzzword of social. So I am intrigued. As <laughs> <That's an idea. laughs> I, I thought this was a horrible idea until I went and looked at my show. It's really not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> well, it seems like if there's a crime to it, because I assume what it does is it takes bits and piece, pieces that, that aggregate automatically. And you have a host who says, you know, somebody's in studio saying like 100 different intros. And then it just chops them all together and creates this thing, right? It was a short show. I only got one intro from Noah Tishby that was very personable, very, very much like I was watching e Entertainment Tonight or something. She said, let's take a look at the five most liked posts from your feed. Number one. And then it showed a post from Body Brushwood. Okay, that about, is kind of cool. Yeah, and then she's like number two, and then it showed another post from like, like Stephen Johnson from about Body something. Brushwood. And it, <laughs> you know, like, wow, it people I knew posting things I hadn't seen because they just flown by in the news feed, and I was I was actually interested. Uh, and then it showed, uh, and then it did another segment of like, and now let's look at uh, at, at the most liked photos or something. I can't remember exactly, but it was a real short bit. And then that was it. That was the end. It didn't go on for a long time. It didn't feel too vague. And I actually saw some content that I was like, you know what? I wouldn't have seen this stuff otherwise. And it was people I cared about because those are Facebook friends of mine. That's awesome. Yeah. I don't know. It's, not, it's no shield. Oh, speaking of which, I've been waiting forever for this. Uh, you know... A uh, friend of the show, Jeff Kanata, formerly of the Totally Rad Show, has spent he spent his entire time on Totally Rad Show calling The Shield the best show on television. And uh, despite the fact that you could already get it as discs, physical media from Netflix, uh, it's never been available streaming anywhere. It's on Hulu right now. No, Stop Amazon, watching. Right? Well, I thought it was Amazon. I went and checked. Turns oh, really? out it's I'm looking at it on Hulu right now. Gotcha. All uh, looks like 89 episodes. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, if you liked... House of Cards, and I'm betting you, I'm betting you anything that this was, if this deal was kind of in the works and was waiting, had to factor in because it's about a scheming, conniving, unlikable bad guy who, who's seductive and you can't stop watching how he's going to get out of this next, next things. The Shield is amazing. The first episode starts off with an awesome twist that makes this person you think he's damned and you just watch as he continues to worm and twist and use people for his will. If you like House of Cards, start watching The Shield immediately. Plow through the entire thing. Guarantee you're going to like it. Don't need to pay Hulu Plus to do it. I'm That's sure. true. Let's see what's premiering this week. Premiering this week! This is what's premiering this week! Check it out! Oz the Great and Powerful is premiering this week. This is a sort of prequel from Disney about what happened to get the Great and Powerful Oz to Kansas. No spoilers if you haven't seen Wizard of Oz. But... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually looking forward to this. I kind of feel like I'm going to be disappointed, though. I want it to be better than I think it's going to be. Well, Sam Raimi. It's what? Sam Raimi. Yeah, and he's done that to me before, though. Spider-Man. You, you didn't care for I thought Spider-Man was the, No, not the first Spider-Man he did, but oh, the, uh, the, the singing Spider-Man. The, the third one. The third second one, one not so great. Good. I thought the third the one was second one was great. Yeah. They had yeah only one first villain. and second one were both fine. Yeah. Uh, but... This space will soon be taken over by the movie draft again, ladies and gentlemen. Brian, tell them the news. Dude, uh, just minutes ago, breaking news here. We have the first draft.nsfwshow.com now forwards over to the current slate of movies for our NSFW movie draft. And we're already getting people complaining right now in the chat room, which is good. This is the kind of thing we want to hash out well, we, and we, right we, now. What we want to do is, is get the best possible slate. So this is not the final... Uh, slate. We might do a little bit of tinkering uh, as we get closer to draft day. But uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the movie draft, we uh, basically do it fantasy football or baseball style. It's an auction draft. We have, what is it, six players? Yes. Six players. We each have $100, uh, and we uh, put together the best slate we possibly can. Auction draft style. The person with the highest domestic gross wins, um, and I will be defending my summer league Title oh, man. This year.
But the king of all seasons gonna be coming right after you. This one, I we mean, were... yes, you're, you're, it's like you, know, you you won like the the Canadian football <laughs> championship with the winter draft. Congratulations to you. Go BC Lions, by the way. Yeah. Screw <laughs> you, Canadian football rocks. I'll tell you what, man. We have so many interesting. Uh, we got lots of sequels, which usually do well. You know, Iron Man three. Uh, of course, we were talking about its troubled uh, second movie. We uh, the Hangover. But part. also, the last time people saw Iron Man. Was last summer was, was the Avengers, so which it's like made more a jillion, of that, yes, more yeah. of that Avengers juice, right? But Hangover Three, which would otherwise, you know, be a completely no-brainer super blockbuster. Yep. Maybe now it's a little dicey since the second one was made a lot of money, right? But wasn't you got a lot as good. of question marks too, like After Earth and Man of Steel and World War Z, Monsters University. We were talking about how like we've never seen a Pixar that made less than three hundred million dollars. Yeah. Uh, three hundred Rise of an Empire is that going to be a flop sequel or is it going to be a huge hit? Well, the Wolverine, of course. Uh, also, the same question. <laughs> man, man of Man of Steel, I think, is the movie that turns the draft. Yeah. Oh, really? You think that's the wild card? Well, because I don't like. I think it's going to be something that it might go for more than it. Like, it, it would not surprise me if it, if it went for more than it should, or less than uh -huh. it should. Like, right. it, You're not it could, saying it's going to be a hit. You're going to say that it's going to be the linchpin, depending on how much you yes. pay for it. Yeah. Right. I think you're right. It's going to be an interesting season. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, definitely write in. Actually, let's uh, frame rate at uh, twit.tv if you guys want to say, if you think that there's any movies that are missing. Uh, we, we, I think Oblivion is the only movie we put in for April, so some people may feel like the, the season should start earlier, but we have so many amazing movies later on. We're starting a little bit later. Uh, I want to point out, and uh, an anonymous coward in the chat room did point it out to me, that, in <laughs> fact, you do need Hulu Plus to watch The Shield. Oh, no! <laughs> Hulu Plus only. <laughs> All right. So, words, my mouth, chewing, swallowing, done. <laughs> Don't send me so, hit on pause. <laughs> Let's see what we're watching. What we're watching... British House of Cards, eh, Brian? Yeah, I only got as far as the first one, and it was really tough. And the pacing, you could tell, man, that movie was definitely, or that made-for-TV movie was definitely made 23 freaking years ago. And unlike something like Lonesome Dove that's set in a period where it's easy to just think of it as the 19th century, you know, it's set in late 80s uh, Britain. And uh, But it is interesting to watch. It's not nearly as thrilling after you've seen the new House of Cards, but it is really interesting to see how they hit the same beats but by, by approaching it in a totally different way. Uh, and then also, um, you guys have heard me talking up regular show. This is how into it. I'm getting, I've gone back and I've, I bought all the seasons again on a different medium so that I can watch them with Bonnie as we sit in bed. Uh, I've been watching the Americans on FX, which I'm continually impressed by, uh, that, that I, I feel like it's a show that I wanted it to be a different kind of show and it's still enjoyable. And it just, every turn, it it impresses me with its ability to keep that that story going. It's essentially about sleeper agents from the Soviet Union living in the United States in the 1980s. Uh, also, Archer this week had Anthony Bourdain yeah, as a guest. I saw that and I thought it was a joke. Like uh, like oh they have they have like I guess there's somebody playing Anthony Bourdain. Does he play himself? It was joke after joke after joke. And yes, it's Anthony Bourdain. Apparently, he's a big fan of the show and bugged the producers till they finally gave in and wrote an episode around him. Uh, he plays like kind of a Hell's Kitchen sort of chef doing a reality show, and Lana and Archer and the rest of them are having to infiltrate the kitchen that day because they need to protect some diplomats or something. That is amazing. Yeah. No, it's it's absolutely worth watching. I also saw Silver Linings Playbook, uh, which I expected I would like, and I kind of loved. I thought it was just a really great movie with great performances from all the actors. Dude, David O. Russell. David yeah. O. Russell's kind of a beast. Yeah, no, that was... I mean, it was essentially a rom-com, but a really twisted, dark take on a rom-com. There's even a, mon a montage, though. Uh, like I'll tell you what, though. Like, we live in a Jennifer Lawrence-centric universe now. Like, I don't I, know. I thought Bradley Cooper and Robert De Niro were just as good, if not better, than Jennifer Lawrence. And yeah, that's but no they're not respect. new. She's great. Yeah. Uh, and, but also, they didn't get passed over for Winter's Bone, so. Uh, real quick, any of you guys watching anything interesting we should know about? 